Good evening, New Beginnings Church. Thank you for participating in service tonight. I trust that you all are doing well, trying to stay warm, seeing as we had a little taste of spring, and then we got nine inches of snow on Sunday and Monday. So thank you again for, for participating tonight. Feel free to let us know that you're listening and watching or participating just by um, saying something in the comments if you're on Facebook. Um, it's been a week, praise God, a good week and a struggling week. I know that a lot of people are, are starting to get a little stir-crazy over our quarantine and our time at home, but I just encourage you to trust in God. I encourage you to stand in awe of Him. You know, we're going to sing a song tonight that says, You alone are better than anything in this world. You alone are all I want. In everything, you are good. So no matter what's going on in this season, we have to trust that God alone will provide our needs. I know it's so easy to get trapped up into the material things, into the to gathering together, and, and yes, that's how God created us as social beings, but right now we just need to learn to trust in him and depend on him during this time, and he'll take us through. So let's pray. Lord God, we just love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. No matter what's going on, Lord, let us learn to rejoice through that. The Bible says rejoice, and then you say again, rejoice. So God, help us to stand in awe of you. Help us to know that you're better than anything in this life. You're better than anything in this world. So God, we love you. We worship you. We just give you praise and glory tonight. Lord, I thank you for those who are participating online right now or even later. Lord, I just ask that we just kind of empty our hearts of the things that, that aren't pertaining to you. And we take this time and we focus on you. And we dedicate this time to you. And we give you the glory that you deserve and already have. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
trust death in the old world because he trust death in me he trust death in me he trust death in the old world trust ye in the Lord forever trust
So, God, we just give you that glory tonight. Again, the glory that you already have. Lord, we thank you that you are alone, God. Lord, nothing else in our life is God. We're not God. Lord, we shouldn't put things in the place of God. You alone are God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, good evening again. If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to open to Hebrews chapter 5. This is our seventh week in the book of Hebrews, and tonight we're going to talk about a spiritual progress report. Think back to grade school when you got your progress report. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to pick up where I left off last week uh, so that it, it, uh, we have an understanding of who Jesus Christ is as our superior high king priest. And remember, like Aaron, Jesus was appointed by God as a high priest, but he was also a king. And there's some distinguishing differences that make Jesus the great high priest who is superior to any other high priest who ever lived. No other high priest has ever passed through the heavens and taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. No other high priest has. No other high priest has made final atonement by sacrificing their own life. Only Jesus did. No other high priest could give us access into the true and eternal tabernacle in heaven rather than the earthly copy. If we look at Hebrews 8, 5, it says, who serve the copy, the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. 
So that gave us entrance. Jesus now gives us entrance into the Holy of Holies to commune with God, where we, we talked about how that tabernacle on earth was a copy of that. No other high priest was in the line of Melchizedek as priest king. No other high priest was ever called the Son of God. No other high priest was sinless, but with perfect understanding of our temptation. No other high priest could offer help at the throne of grace when we are tempted. No other high priest was completely holy and set apart to God uh, fully in his heart. And no other high priest has appointed forever, has been appointed forever as our eternal high priest. That's what differentiates Jesus from any other high priest that we read about in Scripture. And so we looked a little bit at that last week in Hebrews chapter 5, after the author had explained Jesus Christ being the real, the true, and the one and only eternal high priest. And he concluded, we looked at verses 10 and 11, that there was much more to say about Jesus' priest-king role in the Melchizedekian line. If we look at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 5, it says, "...called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say." And then I want us to catch this, and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Ow. One commentator says about these two verses, the writer is about to compare Christ's ministry with Melchizedek, and now he remembers that many of his hearers have, grown, uh, have not grown enough spiritually to grasp his exp explanation. Then he says in verse 11, he turns aside to issue a warning to the spiritually immature Literally, the phrase dull of hearing reads, you have become sluggish in the ears. Sluggish in the ears. So therefore, we need to understand that their problem and many people's problems on earth today um, um, is an acquired condition, our spiritual dullness of listening. It's an acquired condition. It's characterized by our inability to listen to spiritual truth. They weren't naturally slow, so if I would say that, that Joan is slow... <laughs> I'll pick on Joan. You know, that she, she may not pick up things very quickly. That's not what they're referring to here, that they're not naturally slow. They were not intellectually deficient, but they had become spiritually lazy. There's a difference there between not being able to comprehend something and then choosing to become spiritually lazy. They listened with attentiveness of a slug. Think about that. I was watching a video yesterday, and it was from the Como Zoo, in Minneapolis and they were kind of talking about a sloth and the guy was feeding the sloth and he was explaining the life of the sloth and this sloth just kind of moved in like almost like slow motion it would reach out and grab its treat and it would take it and it would move it to its mouth and it was very slow that's just that's why they call him a sloth I guess but these people uh, at this time and there's people today that listen to the Word of God with the effectiveness of that sloth they just don't move very quick about it and they become unreceptive and closed. So in our passage tonight, God would have us to understand that we should be exercising our spiritual senses, that we should be moving towards spiritual maturity, and that we should be inheriting the promises of God. So let's move right into exercising our spiritual senses. So when, what the author writes in Hebrews 5.11 is something that perhaps stings a little bit, that they're slow to hearing, right, or they're sluggish. Um, and, and uh, it would sting to those especially who were not hearing the word of God, resulting in what might call a spiritual lack or a spiritual kick in the pants, right, is what he's given us. Verse 11 says again, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. He's like, I'm trying to explain something to you, but you're not listening. You're choosing not to hear what I have to say. So the early Hebrew Christians might have been at one time active listeners as well as interested students but now they were simply bored Christians. Not bored because the material was boring, but because they chose to be bored. And, and then they, they had not demonstrated any spiritual growth or significant growth in their Christian lives for quite some time. Uh, F.R. Weber's, uh, he, uh, he wrote a book years ago called A History of Preaching in Britain and America, and he talked about the spiritual climate of the awakening, which he described like this. He says, men and women studied shorthand in order that they may take down the sermon notes that were stirring the English-speaking countries. 
It was not unusual to see men with portable inkwell strapped about them and a quill pen thrust over an ear, hastening to join the throng assembling on the village green. So they were writing down every word that they possibly could when they would hear the word of God. They were taking it all in. And I think about what a sight that must have been. Here they are dipping in their ink wells, and they're scribbling down everything that they're hearing because they're so hungry for the word of God. So just as that awakening became the sleeping giant in Scotland and other English-speaking countries, the Hebrews had been the first, to, uh, the first alert and engaged to fall into dull hearing. That's what we're reading right now in Hebrews chapter 5. The Greek word is nothros, and it means that they become lazy, they became careless, and they became slothful. Lazy, careless, and slothful. And, and so listeners, they, and they had an emphasis on being slow to understand. Not again because they were unable to understand, but because they chose not to understand. So now we can see why this verse says it's hard to explain. Right? Because they become sluggish or slow in their hearing. The question that we should then ask ourselves is, are we sluggish in our own ears? Think about that. Are you sluggish in your ears? If so, you're self-condemned to perpetual spiritual infancy. If you're slow to hearing the word of God, either from the word of God, from God himself, in a message, you're, you're, you're self-condemning yourself to perpetual spiritual infancy. The author of Hebrews begins to indicate that they should be at the graduate level. They should be better than that, right? Higher than that. They should be able to teach others now what the word of God says and what they know of God. But instead, they're still spiritual infants. Let's read this in Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So the author here is trying to get them to realize their digressed condition and how they looked in comparison of how they should be. So they're looking like children and they should be the adults. You know, a lot of times if you, especially, I, I think it's about four or five years old, if you tell a, a kid that you call them the baby of the family, the first thing they say is, I'm not a baby. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kid. I'm, I'm a boy, right? I, they want to be grown up. So kids, once they get to that four or five range, they want to start being like dad, and the girls want to be, start like being like mom. And, and that's the kind of desire that God is trying to urge Christians to be like. We get to a point in our spiritual growth where we no longer want to be kids anymore, but we want to be adults, and we want to be teaching others, and we should be wanting to lead others. Watch while he does a little bit more picking in verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those by reason... Of, of, let me read that again. But solid food belongs to those who are full of, of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Here they thought they were big enough for the adult menu, right? And they get handed the kid's menu because they're not grown up enough. And did you know how God, did you see how God decides for them which menu to give them? The adult menu or the kids' menu. Verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are full of full age. That is, those, by who, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So the mature are those who have practiced their faith enough and they've trained their senses enough. Or what the Greek word is, is it's called eistherion. And, and that defines the faculty of the mind to perceive, to understand, and to judge what's good and what's evil. We have to practice that. We have to discern that. Discernment doesn't come naturally overnight. It's something that you have to hone and practice. So to exercise our spiritual senses, they must be trained to practice of our faith. Our faith. The more we practice our faith, the easier our spiritual senses start to work. You know, you think about we have our senses, our smell, sight, hearing, touch, Sight, I don't know, all of them. Taste, we've got all these senses, but then we also have spiritual senses. So we have, spent, we have senses in the natural that we all recognize. When we eat a cheeseburger, it tastes like a cheeseburger, right? And when we touch something, we know if it's hot or cold or if it's rough or soft. If we hear something, we know if it sounds appealing or not appealing to us. If we smell something, I like the smell of skunk. I know a lot of you hate the smell of skunk, but when I drive down the road and I smell skunk, I want to roll down my window. I just love the smell of skunk. I know that's weird. It's okay. 
you can think I'm weird. But you may not like the smell of skunk. So natural senses. But we also have spiritual senses that God has given us. Things in the spirit that we sense. And by faith, we have to exercise those senses. If we don't use them, they don't work very well. So if I would plug your nose for two years and say, now smell this and tell me what it is, you may not be able to tell me what a certain smell is because you've not honed that sense. We know what a skunk smells like because we've all smelt a skunk many times. We all know what, you know, when, when, when somebody at home starts baking cookies, because we know what that smell of fresh baked cookies is like. We've honed those senses. So we need to hone our spiritual senses. We can't just get stuck in orthodoxy, right, or, belong, uh, to, or belonging to certain doctrines. We have to be more concerned with the word called orthopraxy, which is the practice of the doctrine. So it's more than just knowing doctrine, it's living it out, it's practicing and engaging with it in order to be considered mature spiritually. Otherwise, we can't move on to better things. We're kind of stuck. We're drinking milk. You know, uh, if you go back in your Bibles to Matthew 13, uh, and I want to read verses 12 through 15, a lot of people look at this passage as referring to a financial position, but in fact, I think it's talking about what we do with the Word of God. And in Matthew 13, 12 and through 15, it says, For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. So, so we have to be really sure that, first of all, what we have, we have what God has taught us. So God has taught us certain, certain things. We have to hang on to that. We have to know that. Verse, uh, and then we have, we have to have it in order to practice it. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the practice of I prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive for the hearts of the people have grown dull. The word dull here is a different Greek word than we seeing in Hebrews. This means to make stupid, to be blunt, is what this word dull means. So for the hearts of these people have grown to be made stupid. That's pretty harsh. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes have, been cl have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and ear with their, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so I should heal them. The truth is, is there's no such thing as, as a static Christian. There's no such thing as a static Christian. We're either moving, moving closer to God or we're moving further away from God. We don't just establish our position in a relationship with God and say, I'm going to stay here and do nothing about it and stay there. You either draw closer or you draw further away. We're either climbing or we're falling. We're either winning or we're losing. The, 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 status of, uh, the status quo Christianity is a delusion. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a, as, as a, uh, uh, a status quo Christian. We're either growing or falling. So a nursing baby Christian has no ability to discern good and evil, according to Hebrews. But a, a mature Christian is a, practi a practitioner, right? And therefore, they're practicing the word of God, and they're always ready to move to the next level of faith. I read a, few, a book a few years ago written by Erwin McManus, and it was titled Chasing Daylight. And it deals with what he calls first dimension faith and second dimension faith. And let me explain to you the difference between first dimension faith and second dimension faith. First dimension faith he describes as Moses on the shore of the Red Sea and, and, the, and the Red Sea parted, right? That's first dimension faith. Second dimension faith he describes as Joshua and the men who had to step into the river before the water parted, right? And so they, had to be, they were expecting to be part of the miracle, not that Moses wasn't faithful, but he, he, he raised his staff, but the sea parted. In, 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 uh, with Joshua, they had to step into the water before the water parted. So the first is watch, the first dimension faith is watching a miracle happen. Second dimension faith is being part of that miracle. And so a lot of us, we sit back and we go, okay, God, show me a miracle. And we just cross our arms and we say, I'm waiting. That's first dimension faith. You're just expecting the miracle to happen. Where if we step out in faith and want to participate and be part of that miracle, we're going to see more miracles in our lives. If we step into the river, we're going to see more miracles in our lives. God wants us to be part of the miracle. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so how do we ever expect to get to that second dimension faith where we can walk forward and participate in God's awesome movement throughout the world if we never get past the elementary stuff? We're still hung up on kindergarten. 
Therefore, we're never going to step into the water because we're still hung up on kindergarten. The point of this passage is, is we need to get to a place where we can exercise our spiritual sense in all situations, at all times. And that takes consistent application. So even during this time of quarantine, when you're home alone, and, you, and you're sad, and you're struggling, you have to exercise your spiritual senses. God, I know you're with me. God, you're going to comfort me. God, you're going to fill me. God, I'm going to worship you right now. God, I'm going to spend time in your word. And you'll see those, those feelings of sadness, loneliness, and everything depart from you because now you're participating in a second dimension miracle. You're actually acting out something that creates that miracle where God gives you that peace, love, joy, all the fruit of the spirit, and the things of the world and the things that the enemy are putting on you are vanished away. And when we can do that, we're going to be the person that Christ talks about in Matthew 13, where he says, for whoever has, to him much more will be given. The more we step out and participate in the work of God in our own lives and in others' lives, we'll see more given to us by God. The next passage of scripture functions, again, as more of a spiritual progress report to help keep us maturing towards maturity, or moving towards maturity. So in this passage of scripture, you don't have to go very far to connect Hebrews 5 with Hebrews 6 because it starts with the word therefore again, right? Uh, and, let us know, and that's to let us know that there's a call to action coming based on a previous, um, previous information. So verse 1 of chapter 6 says therefore. So he's saying, okay, I just told you all this. Now do this. Leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So Christians, you should already understand that you cannot work for your salvation. Every sermon I give, I shouldn't have to remind you that you cannot work for your salvation. I think it's okay to remind you, but I don't think we need to go back there every message and say, you know what, you can't earn your own salvation. It's by faith in God in his grace, right? Uh, through faith towards Christ is the only way that we can be saved. You cannot work for your salvation. That's an elementary teaching, right? We all need to learn that. We may need to be reminded of that, but I shouldn't give every message, and not that I do, I'm not saying I do. It would be wrong for me to give every message to explain that you're not saved by works, but by grace. Otherwise, you, we never grow beyond that. Does that make sense? So this should be that elementary teaching about Christ that doesn't need to be rehashed and rehashed and rehashed and studied again. But how many times do we find ourselves going back to the subject because we've digressed and, and we continue to seek God's favor in our life, even as believers? Okay, God, I got to work really hard to get your favor. God, I got to do this and do this and do this because I've been kind of slothful the last couple of days. God, I got to, I got to, I got to. But we fall back into that trying to work rather than through faith in Christ. We should be past that by now as believers. And so he continues in verse 2 of chapter 6 of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying out of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. I want us to look at the New American Standard Bible where it says of instruction about washing. There's a different word there than baptism, right? Washing, laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. I like the New American Standard Version translation better because in the New King James where it says instruction about baptisms, notice it's plural, it doesn't have to do with the biblical New Testament baptism that we think of, okay, you're going to get dunked, be baptized, or baptism in the Holy Spirit, right? Um, it's a word that's used about washing rites, per se. And, and the thought is, is that the Jewish, uh, the Jewish custom of washing rites was no longer needed to be considered clean, right? They had all these washing rituals. The laying of hands was also an Old Testament custom. It's a New Testament custom as well. We like to lay hands on people and pray for them. Right? But both of those have now a new and fuller significance in Christ. So laying on of hands in the Old Testament is much different than laying on of hands in the New Testament. And so we continue to read in verse 2 in the New American Standard Bible, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those were not unknown to them. They knew that Christ rose from the dead. They, we all know it. We just celebrated it a few days ago. But now they understand them in the light of who Christ is. So Christ was the resurrection and the life. We know that when he went to the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus in, in John eleven twenty five 25 said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Right? So we know also that Christ is our ultimate judge. 
On Judgment Day, we're going to stand before Christ. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So the point of the text here in verses uh, 1 and 2 um, is, is that you should already know these things and be living them out. You should already know that Christ rose from the dead and is the resurrection and the life. You should already know that one day we're going to stand before God. We shouldn't be struggling in these areas anymore. They should be second nature to you by now. You shouldn't have to go back and lay the foundation every day because the foundation's already laid. Uh, it should be already laid, and we should move on to the next phase of the construction project, and that's building the house. We eventually have to say the foundation is there, it's solid, now let's build on that. And we have to do that in our faith as well. And so what the author of Hebrews is dealing with here is calcified Christians, crippled Christians. And I would even go, to far, go, as, far, go, as, go far as to say <laughs> that some in the group might have been spiritual stillborns. They never got beyond infancy. They died in their faith. They knew about the works that led to death and the faith that led to life. They knew the full significance of the Old Testament washing rites and the laying on of hands and spiritual baptism in the body of Christ and the power to be healed. They knew the details of how and why they would be resurrected and to what kind of judgment. They knew what the house consisted of. They just needed to get the, hammer, the spiritual hammer swinging and keep building. But they didn't build. They stopped at the foundation. And they needed to exercise their spiritual senses in order to hit the nail every time. How? We see in Hebrews 6, 3, and this we will do if God permits. Only if God gives you the power, do those elementary things if he wills to, right? The author gives us a strong warning uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6 to his readers. And a lot of times this is misused, misapplied, and I'm going to give you some of, after I read this, I'm going to give you some of the ways that people use this and how I think it's supposed to be used. But it says, it's for it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall again to renew them again to repentance. So they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him into open shame. So some people look at that and say, once you're saved and accept Christ, if you turn away, there's no chance for you, you're gone. Okay, bear with me. So if you've been losing your grip, first of all, let me kind of take a tangent and I'll come back. If you've been losing your grip on things that you once held tightly and you seem to care less and less about pursuing righteousness and growing up into a mature, effective teacher and doer of the word, then it's probably time for you to take a spiritual retreat and wake up. Spend some time with God. Get back in the word. Get back in worship. And, and do some ref reflective evaluation to get yourself back on track before it gets really difficult for people, the spirit, or any other godly influence to pull you back to a close relationship with Christ. Get in the word daily. Worship daily. We should do that anyway, right? So there are several positions that you'll find on this passage of scripture. One may be that a true Christian is in danger of losing his or her salvation. Another could be that, that this is a warning to the people who profess Christianity, but maybe they were never genuinely saved in the first place. Or maybe the author is speaking hypothetically about a Christian losing their salvation without repentance and only example of, uh, of seriousness of their apathy. But finally, there's a fourth view, and I believe this is what's describing this passage correctly, and that's this warning that's been given to two true Christians about the danger of moving from true active faith in life. It's a point where they become disqualified for further service. They're disqualifying themselves to do the work of God. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul is speaking about his own practice of God's word, and he says this, But I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So if Paul would not measure himself against the word that he preached and submit himself to the very words that he taught, then he would become disqualified for service. And, and for receiving a full inheritance in Christ. So that language is used, that language that is used indicates that once active uh, and awakened, Christians falling away can become disinterested, right? 
just as the awakening we talked about earlier. So the author of Hebrews mentions that those who have once been enlightened, which is a common expression for those that the Holy Spirit reveals the gospel to, those who have tasted the heavenly gift, those who have responded uh, and received the gift of eternal life, um, which talks about in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, those who have shared in the Holy Spirit, the Greek word metohas, met, or partakers, take communions with the Holy Spirit, they've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, those who've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, meaning that after conversion, they actively are learning, they're actively practicing, they're act actively experiencing the goodness of the Word of God and the power or miracles of the coming age. All of these things are clearly descriptive of the Christian journey. We should, be, um, we should be learning, we should be practicing, we should be experiencing the goodness of God's word and miracles. And so these are all descriptive of our journey from the first understanding to the, of the gospel to accepting and believing in it and receiving eternal life and the spirit of Christ all the way learning, practicing, experiencing. Every day should be learning practicing, experiencing. You're never going to get to where you go, I'm done learning, I'm done practicing, I'm done experiencing. That should be happening every day, and, and, and we should be experiencing the Word of God and its power. But then the author pulls no punches, and he says in Hebrews 6, 6, if they fall away. He describes those that after being given so much have sunken into a lethargic sludge, in a sense. So think about, if you ever watched the old westerns and the old movies about quicksand, when I was a kid, I thought quicksand was all over the place because you always saw it on TV, right? Uh, it's so, so you fall into this sort of spiritual quicksand. And once you're in that quicksand, it's hard to get out. You try to pull this leg out, and you're pushing down on this leg, and, and then you're frailing a little bit, and you just start slowly sinking. It's very difficult to get yourself out of quicksand, and it's very difficult to get yourself out of the spiritual lethargic sludge, smudge that you can get in. So I'm not talking about losing eternal life, but I'm talking about a defection from the faith. Again, verse 6 says, If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him into shame. The author is suggesting that there's a deep hardening of their hearts against all efforts to win them back. We all know people who've lived for the Lord and they, they kind of stray away and you try and you try to talk to them about the Lord and they just kind of shove you away, the hardening of their heart. So it's not to Christian conversion, but it's to Christian commitment. It's trying to get them to be committed to Christ again. Sometimes it's just plain hard to convince someone to get back into being a career Christian. They've lived it, they've lived it, they've lived it, and they follow God, and for some reason, they just turn away, and it's hard to get them back to that place again. That's what he's referring to here. And it's hard to get them back to being active in faith and having that commitment to Christ after they sunk into a spiritual retirement or sunk into spiritual quicksand. So the next two verses kind of give us an illustrative picture of what our two choices are in verses 7 and 8. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. Now naturally you and I might think that that burning reference is hell when we read that but I don't think that that's the purpose of the statement. Remember, in our interpretation of this passage, we have to keep in mind the illustration. So the, let me give you an illustration. I grew up on a farm or in a farm, farming community. I grew up in the country. And, and those of you who did, you might know that every so often the ground just stops producing. It stops producing. You have to give it rest or you burn it. I remember my parents would just burn fields. And the ash would fertilize the ground and rejuvenate the ground. And, and you'd have to wait for a period of time after you burned it because the ash were so acidic that nothing could grow up. But eventually you could use that patch of land again. And so God, first of all, provides spiritual rain for spiritual growth. But if all that comes out of the soil or out of the heart are thorns and thistles, then it does no good. The only thing you can do is just to burn it off, start over, let the ground rest, and let it refresh to be of any use again. So having then given this warning to, to his reading audience, the author of Hebrews is now prodding them to exercise their spiritual sense, to move towards maturity, and, 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 or end up with a calcified heart. You have one or the other. Again, there's no stagnant Christian. There's no status quo Christian. You're going to grow or you're going to fall away. And so 
Here, like a good father expresses his hope and faith in them, he points them to the end goal and he instructs them to inherit the promises. So let's read Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. But, beloved, I love the word but, because in English, when you say the word but, whatever I just said, I'm negating that, right? So now he's referring to the believers, but, or the beloved. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. So he's like, you know what? You may have stumbled, you may be lethargic, you may be slugs, but we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show some, the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's beautiful. So God has his appointed, appointed, inspired human writer here, and he didn't want to express that they had given up hope, right? In fact, they were confident of better things for their readers. That's the evidence and accompanying, accompanying salvation. In other words, even though they were still spiritual babies, some of them, right? They still possessed some evidence of salvation. They still accepted Christ into their lives. And now they've been warned about being spiritually lazy and warned about falling away from their faith and reverting back to, in this case, Judaism. But now they're encouraged by the faith of their spiritual leader, the author of Hebrews. So the leader then points out in verse 10 that God is not going to forget what they've done. You know, I, I've seen people who've lived for the Lord, who've won many people to God, and they've fallen away, and they live horrible lives, and you say, well, their life was a waste. No, while they were living for God and they witnessed people, people and they witnessed two people and they brought people to the Lord, that's not wasted. That is still fruit that, that grows. And so God doesn't forget that. But it does reper, refer um, to the support of persecuted and uh, imprisoned Christians and their care for them because they stood behind them at difficult times. Let's look quickly, jump to Hebrews 10, verse 32 through 34. He says, but recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you entrusted a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle by both reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Isn't that good? So this was the work that God would not forget the things that they did to help each other. This was the work that they were at, he was asking them to continue to do. This, these were the things that, that accompanied salvation. These things don't save you, but it's the fruit. It's the after effect of salvation. Because we're saved, then we want to do things like this. And so they were, in, they were encouraged here in Hebrews to continue with that same diligence that they initially had when they were enlightened. We all know people who get saved and they're on fire for God and they share God with their dog. They share God with the birds in the sky. They share God with their neighbor. They share God with everybody. But as we get saved over time, we seem to start get, getting lazy in that and we don't start sharing the word of God with people anymore. We don't even give them hope to get by today, let alone the word of God. And so we, we have to go back to where we were when we first were saved and had that fire and that fervor and practice and live that out in our lives. So they were, they, were, they were to keep doing what they were doing, but they were to do it with more spine. So as we grow in Christ, we should get stronger. We should, our, our frame should be more secure. We should be able to boldly proclaim the word of God, not meekly like we did when we were first Christians, right? And, and, then, uh, and so um, we're to do that because we have an eternal high priest king who won't forget our work in his kingdom. Let's go back to our last verse tonight, verse 12 of chapter 6 that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through the faith and patience inherit the promises. So they were to imp imp impersonate, they were to imitate the faith and perseverance of the patriarchs who inherited the promises all throughout scripture. Think about Abraham of all the nations that were made because he was faithful. We're supposed to go back and live with that same faith. Uh, many others, like we've talked about Joshua and Caleb who entered the promised land because they weren't afraid of the giants in the promised land. They inherited their piece of the pie, right? So we Christians are to be faithful and we're to actively grow up and mature so, so as to pursue and inherit the promises 
plural, that God has for us. He has more than one promise for us. It's not just eternal life. He has promises for us here on earth. So most of us are familiar, like I said, with a progress report. You get in school, right? And you may get that progress report from school telling you how your children are doing if you have children in school. It lets you know kind of areas that they need to focus on, right? And areas that they've been excelling in. And it's a place, there's a place on it that they're being attentive or that they have class participation or they're being disruptive or wherever your kids lie, right? So that you can see how interested they are in a particular subject and where they need to grow. So in closing tonight, I want us to look at this text that we just read as a spiritual progress report for ourselves. And, and although we find our author speaking about the spiritual condition of the Hebrew Christians, I want us to evaluate, our, evaluate ourselves according to the criteria that the Holy Spirit points out in our passage this evening. So I'm going to give you three questions. Um, I don't have them ready to be put on the screen, but you don't need them on the screen. And I want you to ask yourself these questions. Am I a skilled practitioner of the Word of God? Am I a skilled practitioner of the Word of God? Or am I still drinking milk? Do I, do I study the Word? Do I know the Word? Do I know how to use the Word in my life and in other people's lives? Number two, do I recognize spiritual, significant spiritual growth? Eh, I'll read that again. Do I recognize significant spiritual growth in my life compared to last year? So when you look at your life today and you look at your life on uh, April 15th of 2019, you should be spiritually stronger. You should be grown up. You should be standing taller in the faith. You should be growing spiritually. Do you recognize that growth? Number three, am I getting sluggish or am I diligent in my service to the Lord? Again, that has nothing to do with earning your salvation. It's a fruit of salvation. Are we sluggish and we're just saying, okay, God, do whatever. I want to be a, a, a first, what did I call it, dimension miracle watcher? Or do I want to be a second dimension participating in miracles, right? Am I getting sluggish or am I diligent? Let me read those to you again. Think about these tonight. Am I a skilled practitioner of the word of God? And that's in your own life, other people's lives, and everyday things that we do. Do you recognize a significant spiritual growth compared to last year? And are you getting sluggish or are you diligent in, the serve, in your service to the Lord? I want you all to answer those questions in your life and don't be afraid to be truthful with yourself. It's okay to go, you know what, I'm kind of getting sluggish. I need a kick in the pants. Or maybe I haven't grown as much in the last year that I, that I believe that God would like me to. Or maybe I'm not spending enough time in the Word, so no, I'm not a good practitioner of the Word. You can improve all those things by spending time in the Word of God, by spending time in prayer with God, by spending time talking to other believers, by studying the Word of God, by putting it into practice. So again, during times like we're in right now with the coronavirus, during isolation, speaking to an empty room, we, we can look at and we can say, God, how do you want me to grow in this? How do you want, need to grow in this? How can, God, uh, how can you let God work in your life throughout this trial to help you grow? And the answers are in the Word of God. That's the only place you're going to find the answers. You can go to the world and they'll give you any answer you want. Yep, you have a right to be depressed. Yep, the government, they're, they're, they have all this th stuff over you and they're trying to control you and they're trying to beat you down. You can look at the world and there's so many worldviews out there that are unfruitful. Open the word of God and see what God is saying to you and live by and practice what he's saying to you. That's your way to grow. All right, I'm getting on a tangent here. You know, a progress report is just a progress report. Progress report is just, so your progress report today may not look so good, right? But you can adjust to make a better progress report for next month or for tomorrow, right? Or to get a better report card when you graduate. A progress report is just telling you where you are today, not where your grade is in the end. It's just giving you an idea of where you are. So use this passage tonight and these questions to help you refocus your efforts and ultimately to inherit the promises that God has for you. Not just the promise of eternal life, but the promise of peace on earth, love, comfort, all the things that he promises us. Amen? So God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for stirring us tonight. Lord, we thank you for the author of Hebrews being a little bit bold with us tonight. Lord, I pray that, that as we close, that all of us will search our hearts, Lord, and we'll ask ourselves those questions. Am I a practitioner of the word of God? And Lord, if we say we're not, 
Lord, help us to know that the best way to become a practitioner of the Word of God is to know the Word of God, to live the Word of God, to be acting out the Word of God. Help us to recognize, Lord, are we growing or are we, are we just being status quo and, and sluggish? Lord, we need to grow in you. You can excel us in the Spirit, Lord, uh, as fast as we want to grow. Lord, give us that desire to grow in you by spending time in your word, by spending time in prayer, by reaching out to you for the answers because you're the only one that has the true answers. This world, as I said earlier, has so many answers that can lead us astray. Lord, I thank you that I can go to the word of God, I can get on my knees before you, and you'll give me the answers that I need for each day. Lord, help us to know that if we're getting sluggish, or Lord, that are we diligent in our service to you. And that doesn't mean serving other people necessarily. It could be just in worship to you. It could be just an honor to you. It could be living our lives according to how you called us to live our lives. Lord, you gave us a clear formula in the scripture on how to live our lives. Lord, how not to live our lives. Lord, help us to follow what you've asked us to do. Lord, I thank you that Jesus did die for us. I thank you that he is the only high king priest, Lord, that, that's alive today. Lord, that's seated at the right hand of God, that gave his life for us, that understands our temptation, understands our struggles, understands our trials. I thank you, Lord, that he died for me, that I could have life, not just eternally, but life here on this earth life in the spirit. Lord, help us to wake up our spiritual senses. Lord, help us to not let them become sluggish. Lord, help us to pull out of any spiritual quicksand that we may be in. Lord, let us be on fire for you. And Lord, during these times of struggle, during these times of challenges, during these times of the unknown, Lord, when we're on fire for you, when we're looking into your word and we're talking to you and we're worshiping you, Lord, this stuff is just fades away. It's not important because you're more important. So God, I love you. I thank you for everything you're doing in our church body. I thank you for everyone, you're, everything you're doing to those who are participating online tonight. Lord, I thank you for everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. I 
want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. Thank you, Lord, for showing us to push forward, to move onward, to always be wanting to know you more, to be seeking your face, to be hearing what you say, to be practicing what you say, to be, to be experiencing life in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.